Good morning. As we gather to give our worship and praise, as we honor our Savior and Lord, let's stand and sing that He lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see hand of mercy I hear his voice of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christ. And sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other was so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Well, what a, what a delight it is to be together in the house of the Lord today. Hey, as we gather together today, I call to our attention to the first words of the psalmist in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. In that our cry and our, our prayer today that God would search our hearts and know our hearts and refine our hearts that we might be more like Him. Hey, let's pray. Let's commit our morning to Him. God, You are a good God. You are mighty in all of Your doing. And Father, Father, we're just so thankful for Your mercy and kindness and goodness that has showered upon us each and every day. This day, God, we humbly come into Your presence and trust You to speak into our lives. So God, take control of these moments. Move and work in our midst. God, speak personally to each one of us, I pray, and we will thank you and praise you, for we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' precious and mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship together. Let's sing, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Oh, how 
how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. When temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth. Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. I'd like to invite our children up front for children's message time. Good morning, guys. I am glad to see you today. Um, Pastor Paul told me that today he was going to look at being, being, uh, living a life that's on mission, to be on mission, and to have a task, and that we get it done. And Jesus gives us that task. He gives us a task to go and tell. And so I was looking at different people in the Bible, and this one is just one of them that just screams out, go. Um, and his name is Abram. Abram. And in fact, you probably know him by the name that um, God gives him a little bit later, Abraham. 
Have you heard that name before? Yeah, we've, several of us heard that story before. Um, Abram um, was, um, God had come and talked to Abram and told him. In fact, let me read that. Out of uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So, he, so God says, Go. Leave, leave your parents' house. Leave all the people behind that you're related to and go. Go and follow me, and I will show you where you are to go. Whoa, that might be kind of hard to do. Wouldn't that? Do you think that might be hard to do? Yeah, that might be hard to do. But, but listen to what happens. Um, and and then, then God promises to bless him and his family and to take care of Abram as he goes on his way. And then in verse 4 it says, I... Um, let me find the number four. There it is. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So did you hear what, what happened? He went and did what God had told him to do. He left and went to seek what God had for him. And then what happens is, if you read on in chapter 12 and then on in first, several other verses there in Genesis, um, you will see that Abraham starts going out and God starts, he shows him the land of Canaan and says, this is your land. This will be the land that your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids will live. And this will be their land. They will be my people and I will take care of them and I will bless them. It is, it is my plan and you will follow it. And then what happens is, is then he makes a covenant. God makes a covenant with Abraham and that's when he changes his name. What's a covenant? It's a very, very serious promise. It means it's a promise you're going to try very hard not to break. In fact, God does not break a covenant, um, but sometimes people break covenants. But that's, it's, it means it's so serious, you're going to try really hard not to break. You're going you're gonna to promise to do this. And their promise was is that Abraham would listen to God and follow God all the days of his life and a and God would bless and watch over Abram and and do and create this nation of people which we now know are the Israelites or the Jewish people that God led and 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 did so many great things. So, what can we learn from that? We can learn that we just like Abram can go if God calls us to do it. When you get older, when you get older and, and, and it's time for you to go live out on your own, and even though mom says, no, just stay here and live with me forever, um, that it, you will get to decide. And I hope that you're walking with God and listening to God, and you will do what God tells you to do, and you will go where God tells you to go. And then when you go and walk with God, he will show you every way and every step of the way. Will it be easy? Did you hear anything of God saying, it will be easy? No, he didn't say it will be easy. He said, I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. But he didn't say it would be easy. And Abram made a lot of mistakes. If you read the story, in fact, he makes a mistake right off. Did you hear that he said, leave your people? And did you hear that Lot went with him? Abram kind of didn't follow all the time. And so that caused some issues for him. And that was kind of an issue from time to time. So we need to listen to God and do what God has asked us to do and to follow his ways and last to go wherever he tells us to go. It won't be easy. It might be scary, but God will help us. And, and maybe it's maybe today. Maybe God's calling you today to be kind to somebody. Maybe God's calling you because you know of a friend at school or you know of a friend somewhere, maybe here, even here at church, that needs to hear the good news of what Jesus can do and how he can save you. And maybe you need to share that. Uh, I would mess it up. I better let one of my teachers do it. But God's calling you. And you have to decide, am I going to do that? I hope you will. I hope I will. And I've messed up on that sometimes. And, and thankfully, God has taken care of some of those situations. But we need to be people who listen to God and go wherever he has us to go. So let's ask him to help us be brave and strong to do that when he, when he calls. God, we thank you for this day, and I thank you for this story of Abram, that he just went and followed you, God, 
and, and he listened to you, and you um, worked with him, and Lord, we can see even in the story where he stopped and worshiped you and honored you and built altars for you to remember how amazing you are. And we just thank you that you, just like you called Abram, you call us, and you love us, and you've called these boys and girls, maybe today, to share the good news of Jesus, maybe today to share the love by doing something kind for somebody Maybe it's just the difficulty of obeying our parents this day, God. Help us to be bold and strong. Help us to do what you've called us to do. Help us to live on mission with Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. You were good listeners. You can grab a piece of candy on your way back to your seat. God is amazing, and he calls us to go wherever he has called us to go. And we want to sing of his mercies as we go and worship and honor him. Let's stand together and give him our worship and praise as we sing, I will sing of the mercies. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, I will sing. I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our four-year-olds through first graders are dismissed for children's worship. And Arlie and, and Aubrey and Ari are going to come now and share a message and song and give us their worship together.
Oh, man. Uh, thank you, Arlie and Aubrey and Ari. Uh, you sang to me today. If God wasn't in the story and God wasn't in the, in the process, well, I don't know where we'd be. Do you? <clears throat> I, I just want you to know that in my heart, I'm pacing back and forth today. Um, but in the journey, that's not the way it's going to be. Well, hey, let me invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We come to an incredible passage of Scripture. Uh, we've been reviewing in uh, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians, we've been looking at uh, some problem passages. The Apostle Paul ministering in Ephesus, um, mightily used by God. God is moving in power when all of a sudden... An, uh, a company of, uh, of uh, representatives from Chloe's household come, meet him and say, hey, over in Corinth, we got some trouble. We got problems. Uh, there are people who are denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus over there. There are people who are doing some things there. Uh, they're welcoming uh, uh, rebellious uh, attitude and sin in, into, the, into the church rather than repenting and, and finding restoration with God. And there, there are some problems. And uh, so the Apostle Paul fired off a letter uh, to address some of those problems. He said, uh, hey, that disharmony thing you got going on where all of a sudden uh, you're following a little sect of people and you, you got little cliques in the church, you got to cut that out. Uh, the church is the body of Jesus. It's brothers and sisters and Jesus together. Hey, that lack of focus where you, you're, uh, uh, you're making uh, peripheral things a main thing. The main thing is this, Jesus and him crucified. You got you to get that right. He said, hey, hey, that thing about, uh, about where you just decide uh, I'm saved, that's good enough, and you stop growing, you got to cut that out because if you're not growing, you're dying, man. You are dying, and you got you to be vibrant and alive and growing in Christ. And then he said, uh, hey, th there has to be some correction in, in the church uh, uh, so, that, so that we walk in purity and, uh, and we practice holy living as, as believers. Uh, last, last week we talked about this, that we need to defer to one another uh, so that we can all grow and uh, be vibrant in, in our walk with Christ. Today, uh, the Apostle Paul's addressing this. They lost their focus. They lost their mission. They lost the fact that they were on mission, that God had, had them for a purpose and a significant purpose in this world. And it's so easy to do. It's so easy to get em embroiled in the everyday realities of life and lose the fact that we have a holy purpose, that we were designed by God, that we're in this very moment, in this very hour, not by chance and not by, by mistake and not by happenstance, but by the holy purpose and call of God. And God has a purpose for our lives so that we might live missionally before Him. So, so follow along with me, beginning in verse, uh, uh, verse 15. Verse 15, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 
<clears throat> but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my, my ground for boasting. For if I preach... If I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I, if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel." For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law <clears throat> I became as one outside the law, <clears throat> not outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we and imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, and I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Verses 15 through 18, the Apostle Paul says that he has a call to heavenly purpose, a call to holy and heavenly and divine purpose. He says uh, he, was, uh, he was facing some, some uh, uh, accusations there at Corinth. He was, uh, he was uh, denigrated as an apostle in the Corinth, Corinthians' eyes. He was not held in the same favor of some, as some of the other the apostles uh, there at Corinth. It's evident that the other apostles received some kind of support from the Corinthian believers. And Paul and Barnabas were not included in that reality and that support. It's apparent that the Apostle Paul has uh, not exercised his authority or rights in any way, but rather delighted in this simple opportunity. He's going to share the gospel and he's going to preach the gospel. He's going to further the kingdom. And, and all those other things don't matter to him. And, and, and reputation and recognition and position, they don't matter because he's furthering the gospel. The Apostle Paul said he would forego his rights for a greater good, the good of the gospel. He was preaching the gospel. He would abandon the entitlement mentality. We live in a day where people live with an entitlement mentality. We think we're entitled to things. Uh, and, and if we're not careful, we will walk in that. I'm going to tell you, preachers, us preachers are really bad about that. You can hang around with some preachers and uh, they, think, they think they have uh, some, uh, some entitlement. I, I, I had a, a preacher acquaintance that I, I, I used to meet at uh, con conventions and conferences and, and, and we'd go, go, go to, go to a, a meal together or some things and he continually was doing this. He, he would say, do you have a ministerial discount? Did, did you apply a ministerial discount to that? I wanted to crawl under the table. I thought, are you kidding me? We, he, would, he says, oh yeah, you, you don't get that unless you ask, Paul. And, and he started telling me all the places he would ask for his ministerial discount. And I thought, I think I'm busy next lunch date we got. I'm going to tell you, it's not hard to birth an entitled mentality. The Apostle Paul said, hey, I, I'm not, I'm not going I'm not, I'm not to grab what I'm entitled to. He said, I, I'm going to uh, abandon the temptation to retaliation. I'm the one that planted the church there and all of these other people are getting uh, uh, the cred for it. What's, what's going on? He, he says he would, abandon, he would abandon his right to pull rank because he was an apostle and he had some apostolic authority, but he did not pull rank. He would stay focused on the gospel. This is what he was about. I'm, gonna, I'm just going gonna, I'm just gonna to become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. He was on mission. And that's the reality that makes life matter. You know, all, all of our lives 
have some value and our lives are going to matter one day. And what are they going to matter for and what are they going to matter in? And, and what is going to make a difference in all of our lives is this, that we invested them in the gospel. We've been made in the image of God and we're carry about in our bodies the life of Christ that the world might embrace that life. I think all of us at some point ask the question of our, in our soul, am I significant? Do I matter? In a, am I important in any way? Why am I here? And let me encourage you, you're here to carry the image of God in a world that doesn't know Him and to carry the gospel to a world that's in rebellion against Him. And that is a high purpose and a high calling and that is our absolute calling. Because we were loved in heaven before we were ever known on earth. We're not an accident. We're not a mistake. We're here by the purpose of God. So whether we are a CEO or unemployed, we are in the image of God with purpose. And whether we are on the hot list or the not list, we are here and we are in the image of God with purpose. And whether we're a blue blood or an orphan, we are in the image of God and we're here and we have a purpose. And whether we've got a high IQ or we're struggling to get by, we are in the image of God and we've got a purpose. And whether you're first stringer, you're cut from the team. You're in the image of God and you have a purpose. And we're to fulfill that purpose and that mission before God. We're to preach the gospel. Verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, necessity is laid upon me. He has this necessity. There's an urgency, a, a moral oughtness within him, a, a, a driving force, a, a, a vibrancy in him. I, I've, got, I, I've got to, I need to share the gospel. He could not escape this fact. He found life when he was on the road to death. He found life and he had to share life. He had a necessity to share the gospel. And he had a stewardship, verse 17 says. I, I, I'm, a, um, I'm entrusted with a stewardship. He was a household manager of the family of faith and he was trusted to share the gospel. As one who sees the family of faith, whether it's on track or not, he was trusted to share the gospel. Love compels us to share the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, Paul would say to the believers here at Corinth, he said, the love of Christ constrains us. Because one died for all. The love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ constrains us. It compels us to share the gospel. Judgment demands it. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says this, It is appointed unto every man once to die and then the judgment. Now this is true. All of us are going to step into eternity one day. Some of us are a little closer to that than, than the rest of you. But, but all of us, one moment, are going to step into eternity. This is a shocker to me. I've, I did uh, five funerals in nine days here just about a week ago. Five funerals in nine days. And uh, can I tell you, a lot of the people I do funeral, funerals for today are younger than I am. I hate that. They'd all ought to be about 132, don't you think? That's not the way it works. One day we're all going to do something and we're going to step into eternity and 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 in that moment there is no more opportunity in that moment it, this is what's determined I'm going to spend eternity in heaven or I'm going to spend eternity in hell and and as people who know this truth we have an obligation to the people we love to share the gospel because love compels us we love them love compels us the judgment that looms before us, it, 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 it urges us, it demands that we share the gospel. Obedience urges us. Every time you encounter Jesus, his last encounters in the gospels, in the book of Acts, every time you, you hear Jesus and you meet Jesus just before he ascends to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God, every time the church is commissioned to go share the gospel. And if we're going to be obedient, Jesus commands us, to go share the gospel. Now this is the perplexing thing. If you read Psalms much, you'll run across the, an intriguing passage in Psalm 142. Psalm 142, uh, the psalmist says, I looked at my right, I looked at my left, and no one cared for my soul. No one cared for my soul. Ever feel like that? Nobody cares, nobody cares. 
I think a whole lot of our world feels like that. Nobody cares. Nobody knows what's going on in my life. Nobody knows what burdens I carry. Nobody knows what hopes I, I cherish. Nobody knows what secret dreams I walk with. Nobody knows. Nobody understands. Nobody cares. But you know, when you become a student of the gospel, you know what? You're going to find some people who care. Can I tell you there are people in hell who care about the souls of men? Luke chapter 16 tells us the story of a rich man who had much of this world's good and, and a poor man who sat outside of his gates. And the rich man w died and went to hell and the poor man died and went to heaven. And the rich, the rich man saw, he got a glimpse, so the agony was even greater. He got a glimpse into heaven and he saw there that, that poor man that used to sit at his gates and he was resting in the bosom of Abraham, the scripture says. He was, he was basking in the glory of heaven and, and the rich man cried out and he said, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, won't you send Lazarus to my brothers lest they come here? Can I tell you the people of hell care about the souls of men? Sometimes saints of God could care less. And that's our mission. That's why we're here. That's our whole purpose in life. We're to be about the business of sharing the gospel. It's, it's what we do. Maybe you'll be employed and you'll excel and you should excel as a Christian wherever you are. But can I tell you, wherever you're employed, that is your mission field? That you are there by the divine appointment of God? And he has this purpose that you are the missionary to that place to carry the gospel in that world. We're to be aflame with that purpose. I read this week about a young couple from the Netherlands during World War II. World War II. They were Christians. World War II. And they were just, uh, they were engaged. They were so troubled by everything that went on they helped this Jewish man find, a, find an escape to a rural area where he would be safe. And pretty soon they had an opportunity to help another and another and then many. And realizing what that would, that would entail, they made a choice to help. It wasn't long before they were arrested and they ended up in concentration camps. The man was in Dachau. Somehow he smuggled out a note to his beloved. Listen to what he said. Darling, don't count on our seeing each other again. If we won't see each other again on earth, we will never be sorry for what we did. We took this stand for Christ. And know, my darling, and know, my darling, that of every last human being in this world, I loved you most. I just think, wow. There's a couple of young people who had it right. They had a mission from God set before them. And they answered the call. In our text, uh, Paul says, uh, this is what it's about. It's about this mission. And in verses 19 through 23, he says, this is what I want. I just want more. I want more. I want more. Verse 19, Paul's desire is that more would come to Christ. He says, I, I want to win the Jews. I want to win the Gentiles. I want to win those under the law. I want to win those without the law. I want to win the weak. Five times he said, win, win, win. This is, the, this is what was clear in the Apostle Paul. He thought he was, in, he was in a struggle and a battle for the souls of men, and he wanted to win the day. He wanted to win. He did everything and anything in order to lead more to Christ. He became all things to all men that by all means there would be more people come to Christ. For the Apostle Paul, there were no boundaries of grace for people. He said for, for the Apostle Paul, there were no people beyond grace to him. He was just going to hold up grace and see what God would do in the hearts and lives of men. Arthur Burns was... Uh, chairman of the Fed and an ambassador to Germany uh, from the Eisenhower presidency through the uh, Reagan presidency. He was Jewish, a Jewish man, and uh, he came to the White House prayer meetings. And everybody knew he was Jewish, but he came to the White House prayer meetings. And one, one day, somebody who hadn't been there often asked Arthur Burns to pray. 
And there was just silence. They asked the Jewish guy to pray. After a pause, this is his prayer. Listen to what he prayed. Lord, I pray you would bring Jews to know Jesus. I pray you would bring Muslims to know Jesus. And finally, Lord, I pray you would bring Christians to know Jesus. Amen. That's why Jesus came. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. We've got a gospel to share with everyone, with everyone, with every race and color and tribe and nation and country, with everyone. We've got a story to tell. Early in the car industry, one of the car manufacturers made a breakthrough in body design and, and, it, and it brought far greater safety to the industry. It was dramatic. And do you know what that, that uh, car manufacturer chose to do? I, I hope they would do this today. I, I fear they would not. But do you know what they did? They refused to patent their breakthrough. And when asked why they refused to patent their breakthrough, they said, some things are just too good not to share. Man, if you found Jesus and you've got life, that's just too good not to share. Too good. The Apostle Paul says, I want everyone. And he says, I'm going to use all means. I've become all things to all men that by all means, all means, I might save some. All means. Evangelism begins. How does evangelism begin? And what, what, how, do, how do we in, in, engage in all those means? Uh, can I tell you, evangelism begins when we follow Jesus. Jesus called those to follow him. And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. And can I tell you, evangelism begins when you follow Jesus. Because when you follow Jesus, naturally in your conversation, Jesus is going to splash out. When you follow Jesus, naturally in, in, uh, in your encounters, you're just going to be talking about Jesus. You're going to be pointing people to Jesus. You're going to be celebrating Jesus. It's just going to naturally flow out of your life. That's where evangelism begins. If it doesn't begin with following Jesus, then it is, it is artificial and contrived. But when it flows out of this reality that I'm just following Jesus and I'm just so proud of Jesus and I'm so excited about Jesus, I can just brag about Jesus to other people. All of a sudden it becomes a part of the fabric of my life. It happens when we share words. It happens when we share love. It happens in actions. It happens in a myriad of ways. There are a lot of ways we share Christ with people in our world. Let me pull it out a few things, a few moments in Scripture about how people shared Christ. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stood and preached and made a clear presentation of people's need for Christ and their rebellious attitude toward Christ. He used words. He presented the gospel in great clarity. And that day, 3,000 people came to Christ. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul went to the Acropolis and there at Athens he gave a very studied and a very intellectual response to the claims of Christ, to those who needed an intellectual understanding about what it meant to follow Jesus. And some would follow Jesus in Acts chapter 17 at the Acropolis as he practiced what we would... Uh, Uh, an intellectual in, 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 in engagement. Uh, 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 in, in John chapter 9, in John chapter 9, there was a blind man. And listen to how he brought other people to Jesus. I was blind, now I see. Let's follow Jesus. I was blind, now I see. Let's follow him. He used a testimony. I like that. In... Uh, in John chapter 4, in John chapter 4, uh, there was a woman at a well, and she encountered Jesus. Listen now, she brought other people to Jesus. She went back to town and she said, oh, come see, come see, come go with me, come go with me. She invited people. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? 
That's a good thing to do. <clears throat> let, me re, 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 let me restate that. That's a good thing to do. Because you know what? They're going to be embraced by the love of the saints. And who knows? The Spirit of God might speak to them through something. In John 4, the woman at the well invited people to come with her. In Acts chapter 9, Dorcas led many to Christ. And when she died, they, they went and got the apostle to come and raise her from the dead. And they said, look at all that she's done. And through deeds of service and acts of kindness, she introduced people to Jesus. Use whatever tools you can. The apostle Paul says, I've become all things to all men that by all means, by all means, I might save some. Put some tools in your toolbox. Be an inviter. Share your testimony. Make a clear presentation. Uh, do an act of service. Do, do some kind thing. Do something. But use some means by which people can come to Christ. Max Dupree tells the story about his grandson. His grandson locked himself in the bathroom when he was a toddler. And he couldn't get out. And his little, little hands were were crawling under the door. Have you ever seen that? Uh, mothers have seen this when they tried to go to the bathroom and toddlers put their little hands under there. Mommy, Bobby, Bobby. Well, this toddler was locked in the bathroom. His little hand was underneath the door. Let me out, let me out, let me out. They couldn't get him out, couldn't get him out, and so they called the police. And the police called the fire department. <clears throat> and the fire department got him out. And when dad came home, he was kind of distressed because they used a fire axe and broke down the door to get that toddler out. And one of his buds talked to him and said, man, what, what are you thinking, man? Firemen have two tools. They got a hose and a fire axe. You call them, you get one of them. It's all they got. Hey, put some other tools in your toolbox, man. Learn how to share your testimony because if you know Jesus, you have a testimony. And if you know Jesus, that testimony matters and it'll have traction. Practice sharing it. Look for opportunities to love people. Invite. Make a clear presentation and ask someone, have you ever repented to receive and to, of your sin and received Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? Would you like to right now? It's okay. So in verse 24 to 27, he says this. He says, I, I've become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. And so I'm going to run, and I'm going to run in such a way to win. I'm going to pursue. There are people who run races in this world, and they do that for a momentary award. <clears throat> when my boys were in school... They got all kind of medals for throwing shot and disc, okay? They, they, uh, my boys are throwers, and, and God blessed them with some ability, and so early on they started doing some well, so they, so they got these, these, these awards. And, uh, and oh my, when you got medals, that, the medal was a great deal, okay? And you'd come home from a track meet, I got, I got two medals, I got two medals. And, and we'd, we'd display them and put them on a board for each one of the boys. Do you know where those display boards are today? In my basement. Do you know what happens when I say, boys, would you like to take this to your home? Oh, no, not right now. Ah. You want me to throw them away? Well, another year or two, uh, they'll probably be in the trash, okay? And we compete for something that's passing. And the Apostle Paul says, but what we're doing is we're pursuing something that's imperishable. We're looking for an imperishable crown. We're looking for a crown that lasts for all eternity. So run to win. 
In a race, not everybody runs to win. Some run in high school because it's the social thing to do. I do track. Oh my, now it's my race. I'll go do that. And they run, but they don't run to win. Some don't run to win because they don't put in the prep time. The Apostle Paul says, run in such a way that you win. This word run in the Greek text, its root word is the word in our English we get agony from. Agony. He says, apply yourself to agony. Now, distance runners know what I'm talking about. All right? Distance runners, do you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about, brother? Jake? Jake knows what I'm talking about. Man, you run and you push through that wall and, and it's killing you and you're in agony. But you're running to win. I love what the Apostle Paul said this way in Hebrews 12. He says, therefore, he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, laying aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. He says you've got to lay aside the encumbrance. Those are things that aren't necessarily sin. They're not rebellion, but they're things that are, that are superfluous. They're things that aren't helping you on your mission. He says, I'm going to lay aside the things that are soaking up my time and energy and effort that are, are, are pulling me away from the mission God has for me. And then I'm going to lay aside the things that are ensnaring me in the sin, and I'm going to run to win. The Battle of Marathon was fought 490 B.C., 490 B.C. King Darius launched a, a, an attack on Athens, and the Athenians were outnumbered by the Persians dramatically. But the Athenians, when the Athenians came to the Valley of Marathon, this is what they did. They ran the 26 miles across the Valley of Marathon and surprised the Persians, and they were not ready for the battle, and they won the day. And as they won the day, they knew this, that the Persian fleet now would attack the city of Athens. And so uh, the, the, the general, the commander, uh, grabbed his best runner, Pheidippides, Pheidippides, and he told him to run to Athens to warn them about an attack from sea. And so that Pheidippides ran another 26 miles and arrived back at Athens with one word to say. He said, victory! And then he died. He ran 26 miles, did battle, ran 26 miles to deliver his people. He ran to win. Paul says, verse 24, run to win. Become all things to all men, that by all means you might see some come to Christ and run to win. Verse 25, he says, practice discipline. Enter into training. Apply discipline. He said, I buffet my body. I buffet my body. I discipline my body. It's an intriguing Greek word here. Uh, uh, hupoidzo, hupoidzo. It means to beat black and blue. He says, I beat my body black and blue for the purpose of of the gospel. Self-discipline is critical. D.L. Moody, I, I told you I love D.L. Moody stories. D.L. Moody, Moody was asked one day, he said, what kind of man presents the greatest trouble in, in your preaching in the gospel, the greatest opposition, the greatest problem for you in preaching in the gospel? And he answered like that. He answered quick. He said, I, I, I've had more trouble with D.L. Moody than any man alive. Isn't that what we... Isn't that what we face? we got more trouble with ourselves than anyone else. Practice discipline. Bobby Knight, controversial basketball coach, but a national champion, was asked, is the key the will to win? And he said, no, the key is the will to prepare. Discipline. The Apostle Paul received 39 lashes five times, three times beaten with rods, stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked, and he disciplined himself to keep preaching the gospel. He says, he says, run to win. 
Apply that discipline and stay focused, verse 26. Keep your eye on the prize of the upward call. Lion taper steps into a, a, a cage with a lion with, with a chair. And why is that effective? Because the lion tries to focus on four legs at one time. And it's almost, it, it becomes, uh, it almost paralyzes him. And the lion taper is able to do what he needs to do because that lion cannot focus. God has called us to keep our focus laser focused on the gospel that we become all things to all men that by all means we might see some come to faith that's our mission that's our whole life guys if you're a blood-bought saint of the living God that's our whole life hey do your job well that's your mission field but if you are a child of God. That's what we live for. Let's step in to the life. Our musicians are going to come and we're going to sing our hymn of decision. And as God speaks, it's a holy miracle when God speaks. And perhaps today, the Spirit of God has spoken to you of your need of a Savior. And if so, I would invite you to respond to Him. Uh, Tate's going to be standing right here, and he'd gladly receive you. Uh, if you're here and you'd like to unite with our fellowship, I invite you to come. If you're here and you would like someone to pray with you, we would welcome you. So let me invite you to respond as we stand, as we sing. Mm -hmm.